we thank you for this assembly, Father God. We thank you, Father, that we are gathered together as you use Pastor Carter, you, Lord, your, your man of God, your shepherd, to teach and preach your word in this Bible study. Lord, let every heart be open to receive what thus saith the Lord. And we thank you, Lord, and we just ask that you use your facilitator mightily and bless all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We'd like to ask you to, at this time, mute your phones and um, use the chat window if you're online. And if you do um, desire to speak, then unmute your phones and, 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 and talk that way. Praise God, because we are recording. Thank God for all of our... Um, Bible um, companions all over the world and, and many nations who watch these uh, videos and who get them through our website and now through our YouTube channel. And we thank God that he's enlarging the territory, expanding the ministry so that people can study the word of God. Um, God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, for lack of knowledge of me. And we want to be true. Uh, God has called me to be a Bible teacher, Bible preacher, and I want to do it well. I want to serve him well. And I thank God for each and every one of you. I thank God for you, those of you who come on regularly. You are a blessing. And for your testimonies that you send me about how you're growing and how God is using you. And I want to encourage you to keep on keeping on and let the Lord use you. This program, Through the Bible, in one year is reaching a lot of people. I want to thank our teachers in other nations also. And uh, Elijah, we look forward to coming to uh, Mombasa, Kenya in July to graduate all of our students, um, to graduate our students in M Mombasa and all of our students up north in Katali. We won't be able to get to Katali, but we bring their graduation graduation certificates, then Elijah, you will go and, and, and hold the graduation ceremony there. But we look forward to the graduation and the ordination service in Mombasa for people who have studied for three years and have worked very hard and you've earned, you've earned your degree. So we give God the praise. We give God the glory. So 1 Corinthians, background and history. The book of 1 Corinthians was written by Paul around 56 AD. The central message of the book is resolving doctrinal and practical church problems and growth of a church in Christ. One of our Bible students called me yesterday and said, Pastor Carter, I have a question. She said, why do the numbers decrease? Uh, she said, I'm studying uh, she's doing independent study of Through the Bible in one year, and uh, a lady from Florida, and she says, why do the numbers decrease? I said, are you talking about the years? Like, uh, if David was born in 1000 A.D. and he died in 920 A.D., she said, I'm sorry, if, if David was born in 1000 B.C. and died in 920 B.C., she said, yes, that puzzles me. So I explained to her, and maybe some of you just don't know that, some of you just don't know that, um, the, uh, or may not be aware, the, the years decrease in the B.C. period. B.C. means before Christ. So if David was born in 1000 B.C. and died in 920 B.C., that means there was an 80-year time period of decreasing uh, in, on, in the calendars in the years, decreasing progression. And so everything BC, you'll find that the years uh, decrease. Then AD, AD Adel, uh, Domini, meaning after Christ was born, then the years progress. Um, for example, if you were born in 1960 and now it's 2017, uh, that is because we're in AD. So in B.C., the years decrease. Um, it, some people say, well, how can a person live in 1000 B.C. and die in 920 B.C.? That doesn't jive. Well, we just want to take a little time out to explain that and um, thank God for that. Back to the church at Corinth. 
the church was established by Paul when he visited there on his second missionary journey. Paul spent 18 months in Corinth in the years uh, 50, 50 through 51 AD, 18 months. After his departure, he continued to carry on correspondence with the church in Corinth. Paul showed extra love and care in dealing with the Corinthians and the issues that confronted this fellowship. Ladies and gentlemen, as you look at the church at Corinth, you're looking at the modern day church. You're looking at issues in Corinth that exist today. And we need to look at how the Bible uh, teaches us about the issues in the first century church, how Paul dealt with that, and uh, how we are to deal with these issues. That is why the Bible is so important. We ought to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Ladies and gentlemen, as we go through this study, you will see that Paul was a disciplinarian. Paul did not play. He took his calling seriously. And when he ministered to people, he ministered on a very serious note. We need that kind of sincerity, that kind of discipline today. And and I, I, I wish I wish I, I, I wish I had the opportunity to teach pastors. Uh, just get all the pastors in the world in one session and just share and, and teach the word of God. Uh, uh, and if so, I would love to teach the, the book of First Corinthians to pastors. Paul um, showed extra love and care in dealing with the Corinthians and the issues that confronted this fellowship. When he was on his third missionary journey and during his three-year ministry in Ephesus, he received disturbing reports concerning moral laxity among the believers at Corinth. It was on his third missionary journey that he received reports about the moral laxity in this church. In order to remedy the situation, Paul sent a letter to the church at Corinth, and we find that in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. However, this particular letter must have been lost because there's no re record of the letter that Paul sent to the Corinthians in, in dealing with the moral laxity that was taking place. Um, but we will discuss that. After the Corinthians read Paul's letter, they then sent a delegation sent by Chloe, a member of the church. They sent a dele delegation to visit Paul concerning the existence of divisive factors in the church. So Paul sent a letter to Corinth about the moral laxity, the, 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 the immoral things that were going on in that church. That letter was lost. Uh, uh, there's no record of it. Uh, the, the Corinthians received it, but there is no record of that letter. And then after he had um, sent that letter, then he received a delegation of Corinthians, and they uh, came to him to talk about all the divisions, all the divisive factors in the church. Before Paul could write a corrective letter to the Corinthians to deal with those divisive issues, here comes another delegation of Corinthian believers. And um, they had certain questions that they, had, they wanted to ask Paul. They had a list of questions. So Paul, in addition to traveling as a missionary, planting churches, working as an apostle, uh, and caring for the churches, Paul had to care about the divisive issues in the churches, the moral uh, turpitude in the churches, uh, or, or lack of morals in the churches, uh, the infighting, divisiveness. And uh, this one man really was an amazing man of God as he uh, set things in order in many churches. We find that the book of Ephesus Paul wrote to the Ephesians to set things in order there. And Ephesians is the book, we call the Ephesians the book of church order. Paul set things in order. So if Christians today would take the time out and study the book of Corinthians, 
we could eliminate a lot of problems that are going on in our fellowships. There are a lot of things going on that should not be go going on. They are not biblical. They are not uh, according to the way Christ established his church. And, and uh, I blame a lot of the pastors because a lot of pastors don't teach what ought to be taught. Uh, uh, most people don't want to be taught. Many Christians don't want to be taught. We've got to we've got to deal with a lot of Christians who are lazy, ladies and gentlemen. Lazy. We got all these Bibles. We have access to Bibles, but we're too lazy to read the Word of God for ourselves. But I thank God for our students, for you, and I through the Bible in one year. You work. You do your homework. You do your preparation, and and you're you're studying diligently, diligently. And I want to encourage you to continue doing the same. I wish that all believers all over this nation and the nations were as diligent as you are and would study the word. And um, I know there are pastors who would get angry with me for what I've just said. They don't want anybody messing with their people. Don't mess with my folk, they say. Uh, I teach them um, and and, 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 and so there, we got a lot of proud pastors out there. Some can't even read. Some don't, don't even know the scriptures. But they preach. They put a little sermon together on Saturday night. And, and, and people like it. And, 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 and people are hung up on personalities. I mean, people love their pastors now. The uh, pastor can be right or wrong. But I want to know, can the pastor teach? Does the pastor teach the word of God? Uh, is the pastor diligent? I praise God for uh, Dr. Gene Bratton. I praise God uh, for for Minister Carolyn uh, Gray. I praise God for Linda Barrett. I praise God for Elijah Wena. I praise God for Jackie Carter. I praise God for the many teachers we have uh, who are serious about teaching the word of God and are not afraid and are not ashamed to teach the word of God and rightly divide the word of truth. The Bible teaches us to study, to show yourself approved. And then I thank God for all of you who listen in every week. You're studying to show yourselves approved unto God. And the beautiful thing is I love your teachable spirit. I love the fact that you want to be taught and you're willing to be taught. And all of us uh, ought to have a teachable spirit and God can work with a teachable spirit. And so it was then uh, when, when the second delegation arrived from Corinth that Paul sent Timothy to Corinth to deal with the issues facing this young church. We find that in 1 Corinthians 4, 17. Then Paul wrote the letter that we are uh, now know as 1 Corinthians. So here's a scenario. Uh, Paul heard about the moral laxity of what was going on in in Corinth uh, and the main thing that shook Paul up was a man was having sex with his father's wife a member of the church was having a sexual relationship with his s mom and and that was going on and the church knew about it and and Paul uh, was uh, particularly upset because this person was a leader in the church and was having an open sexual relationship with his father's wife in the church. And ladies and gentlemen, the church officials were not doing anything. And Paul jumped on them. Yes, S-mom means stepmom. And Paul jumped on them and said, oh, no, no, you cannot do this. You, you cannot. You must attend to this situation. You must discipline this situation. And Paul sent that letter to them. And then he... Uh, 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 talks about it again in 1 Corinthians. So that letter, that disciplinary letter that has lost, long been gone, uh, uh, nobody can find it. Um, there's no copy of it. But after that letter, then a delegation came to Paul and they uh, complained to Paul about all the issues, the divisive issues going on in the church. And then before Paul could even write and respond to that, another delegation came to him uh, and uh, with a whole lot of questions about what the church, how the church ought to be run and, and what was needed in the church. So we, this First Corinthians is such a, a monumental book because it addresses a lot of the issues that uh, attacked 
the first century church. And ladies and gentlemen, the sad thing is many Christians have not learned, have not studied, and many leaders have been uh, cold towards studying the Word of God, and, and many have not been uh, 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 convicted enough to address the issues. If you are a pastor, you need to address the issues in your congregation. Ladies and gentlemen, as a pastor, and when I pastored church congregations, I addressed issues. I did not care who did not like it. Ladies and gentlemen, even today, uh, uh, we pastor the online church, and, 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 and even today, I will address any issue that comes against this ministry or any issue in this ministry that is not right. That's just the way I am. You see, when God called me to pastor and called me to uh, preach the word of God, he did not call me to be a punk. He did not call me to be a wimp, and he did not call you to be a punk or a wimp. Ladies and gentlemen, if you skirt around this word and do not do what the word says, guess who's going to have to pay? Guess who? Look in the mirror and say, that person right there is going to have to pay. And 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 you can and God is not going to take that excuse. Well, Lord, I didn't know because we do know. And um uh, heads of households. If you got issues in your fa household, you need to address them. Uh, if you blink your eye at them, the time is going to come when you're going to wish you had addressed those issues. Parents, if you don't address your children or grandchildren, uh, the time will come when you will have to face those things. Husband and wives, the same thing with you. So the scripture gives us a way to deal with problems. And in this Corinthian church, as powerful as this church was, and as important as it was in this great city of Corinth, this great city that was the commercial center of the whole wide world, and, and perhaps um, along with Athens, the religious center of the whole world, uh, Paul had to take a stand, and this church had to really take a stand to live up, up to the principles of Jesus Christ and and for the purpose for which Jesus Christ gave his life on Calvary so categorically this letter is a pastoral letter meaning that it was written to resolve doctrinal and practical matters within the church it deals with factions in the church at that time yet it should be applied to our times. I wonder how many of you can identify factions in your congregation. You know, people who won't speak to other people in the congregation. I, they won't sit on this side of the ch church. I don't uh, want to sit over there. My family members sit over there. We ain't speaking. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, these factions and these divisive things uh, uh, should not be. And it's a sad pastor who plays upon the divisiveness in the church. I know there's some, some of you crooked pastors out there. You love to see the drama in your church because you know how to play one group off against the other. Uh, but these things ought not to be. The church ought to be a harmonious body that flows in the love of Jesus Christ. I said the church ought to be a harmonious body that flows in the love of Jesus Christ. Paul's letter to the Corinthians reveals some of the typical Greek cultural problems of Paul's day. And as we study, we ought to take a look, good look at if we're talking about Ephesus or uh, if we're talking about uh, uh, of the church in uh, uh, Thyatira or, or the church uh, here, the church of Philadelphia, uh, Pergamon, we need to know what were the cultural things going on. And even in our churches today, there are cultural things that go on. You know, there are cultural things that go on that may prevent you from preaching in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, Gene Bratton. There are cultural things. There are some things uh, you can preach until your face turns blue. But uh, there are people in Wilmington, Delaware said, well, my grandmother didn't believe that, and we don't believe it, so you can preach to your green. And, and because the culture will not accept what you're saying. That is why we need to accept the Bible as the true word of God. And the Bible supersedes anything that grandmom ever said. Anything that your daddy ever said. You, I know your daddy was a great man, but the Bible is greater than your daddy and mine too. One of the great problems that Paul had to address 
was the gross sexual immorality in the city of Corinth. Corinth was a sexually immoral place. Corinth was the sex capital of the world. The Greeks were known for idolatry, divisive philosophies, a spirit of litigation. In other words, they loved lawsuits. I mean, reminds me of, uh, of, of some areas we've seen in the USA. Love suit city. Love suit city. Philadelphia, man, they tell kids if a car comes close to you, fall backwards and pretend you're hurt. Even if the car doesn't hit you, fall, fall down, fall down, and, and, and pretend you got hurt because then people will come and, and get the address and the name of the person, the license plate, and initiate a lawsuit. Uh, one call, that's all. We've got a lawyer here in Atlanta. One call, that's all. In other words, if you have a law <laughs> a case, one call, that's all. 1-800-CALL-KEN. One call, that's all. Ladies and gentlemen, you got folks, and, they, and they, they play it to the max. They play it to the max. They could take a couple of us, I mean us, and put us on the commercial. And 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 I saw one guy on a commercial today. He said, Ken got me $525,000 in my lawsuit. Then another lady, uh, one of us, uh, Ken got me $375,000 in my lawsuit. One call, that's all. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm, I'm, it's kind of funny, but this is the way it was in Corinth also. It was Lawsuit City. The sexual sins and uh, litigations, divisive philosophies, and uh, one call, that's all. And there was a real heavy rejection of the bodily resurrection of Christ. They rejected the, the idea that Christ rose from the dead. So the city of Corinth was one of the most important commercial cities of the day and it controlled much of the shipping between the east and the west. Corinth was located on the narrow neck of land that served as a land bridge between the mainland of Greece and the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Corinth was famous for its sexuality and sacred prostitution. It was famous for sexuality and sacred prostitution. To Corinthianize was an expression that meant to practice prostitution. So if somebody was Corinthianizing, they were practicing prostitution. Men and women practice prostitution. Reminds me of Miami, Florida. Uh, you can walk the streets of Miami, Florida, be driving through Miami, Florida, and naked women and naked men will walk up to your car. Uh, uh, their plate, New York City, they've got naked folks walking up and down the street, uh, giving out their calling cards. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is nothing new. It was going on in uh, Corinth. It was going on in the ancient world. It was going on uh, way back uh, before the time of Noah. And that is why God sent the flood to wash all that filthiness off the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, it's even worse now. It's even worse today. I heard somebody say, if, uh, 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 if God does not destroy the United States of America, he has to give an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. I heard that, ladies and gentlemen. Or Nairobi, Kenya. If, if, if God does not destroy Nairobi, Kenya, uh, or Mombasa, Kenya, we've been there, we're getting ready to go back there, and there's so much sin there, wickedness. If God does not destroy these places, then he's got to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Paul had a lot on his hands, and the church, ladies and gentlemen, the church must stand for righteousness. Even though your culture may promote uh, uh, lesbianism, same-sex marriage, uh, uh, homosexuality, gambling, lust, drunkenness, uh, uh, lawsuits, even though your culture may promote that. And when we look at the United States, our culture promotes much of this and much of this is legalized. Uh, uh, marijuana is legalized. Uh, you can you can you can now buy marijuana oil and rub it on your skin and get high. Uh, you can you can sniff it, snort it, uh, 
everything's legalized. Ladies and gentlemen, the culture has made so much uh, uh, that is sin uh, available, and the government has legalized it. Yet the church needs to take a stand. But here's the problem, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. The same people who make the laws go to our churches. The same people who are uh, carrying out these laws and, and water down the laws and, 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 and um, legislate things that are contrary to God's will are leaders in the churches. Uh, uh, they're, uh, they're, some are sitting up in pulpits. And so there's a need, ladies and gentlemen, for a worldwide revival. There's a need for worldwide repentance so we can get back to what the Bible says. I thank God for this book of 1 Corinthians. There were over a thousand professional prostitutes serving in the temple of Aphrodite or Venus. Uh, over a thousand professional prostitutes. Now these were male prostitutes and female prostitutes. It depended on uh, whatever a person's preference was. If they wanted a man or a woman, uh, these prostitutes were there. Given this background, it is not difficult for one to imagine that the spirit of the city showed up in the church at Corinth. Consequently, this church had a lot of problems with sexual sins. The letter to the Corinthians consists of Paul's responses to 10 separate problems in the Corinthian church. Now these are uh, the problems that Paul dealt with. A sectarian spirit. In other words, denominational, denominationalism. You know, there are denominations today. Uh, they're not, uh, they, they do not uh, uh, consider themselves to be a part of the body of Christ. They use the term body of Christ, but they are so closed-minded, so narrow-minded, that you have to be like them to get in and to stay in. Denominationalism, they don't. Uh, fellowship with others, they don't encourage others, uh, uh, they have no concept of the whole body of Christ, and Jesus died for all mankind, not just a handful, or not just a, a few folks who look like us, or a few folks who look like them, or a few folks who act like and talk like us, or talk like them. So Paul had to deal with sectionalism in the church, a sectarian spirit, incest, Ladies and gentlemen, incest. We talked about the man who was having sex with his S-mom, his father's wife. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, the scriptures, the scriptures, uh, the law of Moses talked about incest. Incest, if a man has sex with his daughter, if a, a boy has sex with his mom, uh, uh, any kind of incest was punishable by death, ladies and gentlemen. It was punishable by death death. But yet in the church of uh, Corinth, they were practicing it. I, I wonder how many people in, in our churches today are practicing incest. There's all the types of stuff going on in people's households, all kinds of child abuse and all kinds of abuse, and incest is one of them. And um, we get testimonies of people who are uh, uh, hid uh, their problems for many years. Uh, uh, we talk about, uh, we hear a famous, uh, one of our famous evangelists on television talks about how her father abused her, sexually abused her for mm -hmm. many, many years. I'm not going to call her name, but for many, many years, her father abused her and fa her father had sex with her for all those years. And, 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 and these men are going to pay in hell. They're going to pay in hell. But also mothers are going to pay too. Just uh, about a month ago, I read about uh, a mother who married her son. She hmm. married her, ladies and gentlemen, and they showed a wedding picture of mother and son kissing at the wedding. They, she married her son. In other words, she has sex with her own son. This is an abomination, ladies and gentlemen. And, and, and you know, there are churches who allow this to happen. And then about a year ago, uh, there's a church in Ohio where the pastor is a woman and 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 and, and the first lady is a woman uh, uh two women uh, uh pastor's a woman and the first lady is a woman then in illinois there's a church ladies and gentlemen where the pastor is a man and the first lady is a man ladies and gentlemen yeah. 
and and they have a big following because these spirits follow because the law says homosexuality is all right lesbianism is all right gay marriage is all right now you have gay churches that are uh, people are flocking to them but ladies and gentlemen judgment is coming judgment day is coming and and it's going to be a sad day a sad wake up call when 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 the angel blows his trumpet and Jesus cracks through the crack, through the sky there will be no chance to undo what has been done and another sad thing is people hear this and they th they think people like uh me and 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 Gene Bratton and Jackie Carter and 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 Carolyn Gray and other teachers they think we're crackpots cuz cuz we stay on the word of God uh and we stand on the word of God but i say stand on the word of God people will hate on you they hate it on Paul other issues he had to deal with the the multiple lawsuits one call that's all fornication in the church fornication in the church ladies and gentlemen that's a major issue today fornication in the church that's why a lot of pastors have lost their power uh, pastor yeah. if, you, if you sleep with a choir member or you sleep with the chairman of the deacon board or you sleep with a trustee or a steward you have lost your power you have no more control over that church nobody's going to listen to you because if you sleep uh, 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 with your neighbor's wife or you sleep with sister so-and-so uh, you know she ain't going to hold that to herself and she's going to hold it hostage over you how can you correct or discipline anybody how can you teach anybody if you've been sleeping with them and and outside of your marriage uh, other problems marriage and divorce marriage and divorce was a major issue in Corinth and eating food that was offered to idols eating food that was offered to idols uh, when you eat food that is offered to idols that means you're denying Jesus Christ you're 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 saying I I, I deny Jesus Christ I'm gonna eat this food that's offered the, the, the to this idol Buddha or whoever ladies and gentlemen these things these things happen in Corinth wearing of the veil was a very important thing and I uh, hope we can get to that part uh, hope we can get to that part where um, I hope we can get to that part where the women Paul has been so um, Paul has been talked about so much that uh, uh, many women have no understanding of what Paul taught because many women do not thoroughly read the scripture and have not been properly trained. But Paul was not a woman hater. He did not hate on women. Uh, he did not try to prevent women from prophesying, from preaching. He said, if you're going to do it, do it decently and in order. Do it the way uh, you've been taught and, and wear that veil and uh, men uh, uh, uncover your heads and the see the so we need to look at the culture when we study the scripture the culture of what was going on and so we've got a whole lot of women all over the world hate the the Apostle Paul so that means they don't read 14 books of the Bible ladies and gentlemen they do not accept 14 books of the Bible because they said Paul was a woman basher a woman hater no he was not he was not Paul stood on what the Holy Spirit gave him and that's what he taught but people have taken Paul's teachings and have made their own philosophies out of them and have caused division in the church no letter in the New Testament gives a clearer insight into the life of the first century church than uh, 1 Corinthians in this letter Paul provides straightforward instructions for such moral and theological questions as sectarianism, spiritual immaturity, church discipline, ethical differences, the role of the sexes, and the proper use of spiritual gifts. Paul gives uh, teaching on tongues, uh, speaking in tongues, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's all right there. It's laid out there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, and 14 uh, there are people in the body of Christ they don't believe in tongues they believe tongues is of the devil all contraire tongues is a gift of God read how can you read Acts Acts and and jump across uh, Acts chapter 2 when this when the uh, the 
Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church and they began speaking in other tongues. So Paul gives clarity on this and we just need to take time and study the Bible and, and have a teachable spirit and to learn and accept what God has to say. Believers from non-Pentecostal or non-charismatic churches may receive a fresh challenge from the vitality and spiritual gifts that are evident in the Corinthian church. Uh, I know there are a lot of churches, they go through this uh, spiritual gifts assessment. Uh, they have this uh, a whole uh, uh, um, evaluating procedure. Uh, what are your spiritual gifts? How do you discern your spiritual gifts? But ladies, get, ladies and gentlemen, spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost gives a gift as he chooses. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't choose your spiritual gift. You say, I want the gift of prophecy, or I want the gifts of administration, I want the gifts of helps, I want the gift of preaching, but you don't want the gift of tongues, you don't want the gift of laying hands on the sick, you don't want the gift, the gift of uh, casting out demons. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the Holy Spirit who gives the gifts. I'm going to repeat that. It is the Holy Spirit who gives the gifts. He's all wise. He knows what gifts he wants you to operate in. So if God has given you gifts, if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, why go through this whole uh, a workshop on spiritual gifts and go through this, this assessment and all this? Ask God. Ask God, Lord, what is my gift? And then when God reveals to you what your gift is, now, Lord, show me how I ought to operate in this gift. He will teach you. He will give you the scriptures. He will show you how to operate in that, ladies and gentlemen. And then I say, stay away from those folks who are so critical of spiritual gifts. I remember when I was in seminary, they used to laugh and tease the brothers who spoke in tongues and 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 and, and uh, uh, prophesied and 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 laid hands on the sick. But then uh, keep living, keep living. You'll get sick. Keep living. You'll be glad to have somebody who speaks in tongues come and lay hands. <laughs> keep living. I say keep on living. You'll be glad. And and a lot. I know a lot of people who I went to seminary with are eating humble pie. I mean, they talked about one of my friends. He was a Holy Ghost filled pastor, and I didn't even know what the Holy Ghost was basically. Uh, and they used to tease him and laugh at him, but I wouldn't laugh. And 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 they talked about it like a dog. And then I, I remember after I graduated from seminary, when I was sitting up in the back in the Baptist church, a young minister, cold as can be, cold as ice, and 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 watching my pastor struggle to preach and what, looking at the people and the, uh, all the mess going on in the church. And one day the Lord said, "Don't go there this Sunday. I want you to go and get the." Holy Ghost, get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And God sent me to the very church where my seminary classmate was pastoring, the one they teased and laughed at and all that. And when I came out of that church, ladies and gentlemen, that was over 40 years ago, I have never been the same. I have never, ever, ever been the same. What God gave me, what God did in me, ladies and gentlemen, words cannot explain. I'm talking about the real God. I'm talking about the real God who has power for his people. And 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 so God has been teaching me for many years, don't follow the crowd. The crowd may not always be correct. Don't follow the crowd, but you follow the Holy Spirit. You follow what the scripture says and do what the scripture says and and, and God will get the glory. So the organization, the central message of the book, it's kind of long, resolving doctrinal and practical church problems and growth of a church in Christ. I think I'll put that in the description on the website. Resolving doctrinal and practical church problems and growth of a church in Christ. Okay, Paul starts in the greetings and he what he does with, and I love his approach to the church of Corinth, with all the problems they had, and he knew about their problems. He didn't go there and beat up on the people. A lot of preachers go to the church, especially guest preachers, uh, and, you know, what they call revival. It, Lord Jesus, help me, help me teach this. What they call revival these days, you know, it used to be, it used to be, 
Uh, Dr. Jean, remember when people would fast for two weeks for a revival? Fast, turn yeah. the plate down and fast, have yeah. prayer yeah. meetings, groan and travail, ask the Lord when the meetings begin, do signs and wonders, and, and people would yeah. groan and travail. You had your prayer band, your morning prayer band, your noontime prayer. People come to the church at night fasting and praying for revival. Remember we used to do that, Dr. Jean? Yes. And we walk in, yeah. and the, the day the meetings begin, God began pouring out miracles that very day. Remember that, Dr. Jean? Yes, I do. Nowadays, when they people say revival, you know what? It means they're going to have three nights of services. They're going to find three preachers who go, who's going to bring their congregations with them, and they're going to have a big offering, and they're going to raise some money so they can pay some of the church bills, and they, they call that a revival. Nobody got saved. Nobody got delivered. No demons were cast out. No miracles took place. And, and, and that's what they call revival here in America. I don't know yep. what they do in Kenya. I don't know what they do in, in South Africa. But it's a sin and a shame, ladies and gentlemen, how uh, our church leaders have, have, have deceived the people and even gotten to the place, place where they can audaciously say, we're having a revival at our church. And, and, and no prayer. I mean, absolutely no prayer, no Bible study, no fasting, no groaning and travailing. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to have real revival, there's got to be groaning and travailing. You've got to be praying in tongues. You've got to be prostrate on the floor. You've got to deny yourself. You've got to turn that plate down. You've got to call on the Lord. You've got to say, Lord, that's, I can't do anymore. We need you. And you've got to just surrender. I mean, people, if you're going to have a real revival, folks have got to die. Folks in the church have got to die. What do you mean, pastor? They're going to have to die. People are going to have to die to themselves and their own agendas and their own programs. And, 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 and uh, we've got to die to self and Put our will on the altar and call on the Lord, Lord, whatever your will is, let it be done. That's revival. That's revival. That's why, Dr. Gene, we were able to see uh, miracles in uh, uh, 30 years ago, 25 That's years right. ago. We were able to see people, demons, cat, I mean, people would come in uh, full of demons and, and the demons cast out. And we see people delivered. And we know people today who are walking in holiness, uh, who were once thugs, who were once killers, who were once hom homicidal, who were once haters. And now they are free because they came to a real revival where God's people trusted God to do what man thought was impossible. Can I get a witness? Amen. Praise God. And so Paul, as messed up as the church in Corinth was, Paul affirms them. He affirms them. He calls them sanctified, called to be saints. He talks about the grace of God given to you by Jesus Christ. In other words, he let them know that they were saved, even though he said, you're still yet carnal. You are still yet babes in Christ. But he affirmed their salvation. And then because he affirmed their salvation, and even though he knew many of them were messed up, he was able to go from that point and to teach them and to correct them. And we can do the same thing in the church today. If people really want to change, they can change. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go out online and say this. If you're listening to this and you're gay and you, you're a man, you, you, you like men, or you're a woman and, and you like women, you can be delivered. You can be delivered if you choose to be delivered. Ladies and gentlemen, I know there are people who listen to these tapes, and I know there are some people, and I know there are some uh, uh, where, where women are actually married to other women. I know you love that woman, but it's, it's against the word of God, and you've got to get your house cleaned up, and God will show you a way if you really want to be delivered. But what happens is when we start teaching on this, people get mad at the postman. They get mad at, mad at the mail carrier. I'm the one bring. I'm just reading what's in the book. I didn't write the book. But if you really want to be delivered, if, if, if you're a man, and I know there are men all over the world, men, they like to fondle little girls and little boys and, 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 and some like little, little uh, pre-teenage girls and, 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 and you're, you're cheating on your wife. Or there are men who uh, uh, can't stay out of, stay out of, out of other men's uh, uh, houses. 
uh, men go off to work and you sneak into their houses. Ladies and gentlemen, you can be delivered from that. God wants us to live holy. And then there are some people, you, some, some people listen to this tapes, you're sexual perverts. You're perverted. You got these little toys, these little gadgets, these little instruments, these little arousal toys. You got to put that away. And then there are some of you who have idols. You worship idols. You've got idols in your heart. You've got idols in your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, if a man's having sex with his wife and he's picturing some other woman, that's idolatry. Man, that's idolatry. You can be delivered. And so, uh, and, and ladies and gentlemen, I know preachers. I know preachers preaching in the pulpit, ladies and gentlemen, and are going to serve communion on Sunday. Come on now. They're going to serve communion on Sunday and still got the smell of some other woman on their fingers where they were with some other mm -hmm. woman that same morning or the night before. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an abomination. We should not embarrass our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, they would hate on me be, uh, for preaching this, but... God is holy. We're talking about holiness, holiness unto God. There are times we need to turn our plate down. We've got to sanctify ourselves, get clean. We've got to pray. We've got to fast and pray. And if we know of any uncleanness in us, we've got to be delivered. Then there are people who are mean, just plain mean folks, like to be contentious, always want to argue, always want to mean. That's a, that's a demon spirit. But you can get rid of it if you read 1 Corinthians. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a book uh, will get people uh, delivered. Well, the time is, is really moving fast. But Paul had to deal with contentions, sectarianism. Some said, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Jesus. In other words, uh, Paul, Paul taught me the gospel. I got saved under Apollos. I got saved under Cephas. And they won't listen to any other preacher. Ladies and gentlemen, that should not be. God sends whoever he will to preach his word because God wants a church that's harmonious and a church that's loving, not a church that is, is sectarian or a denominational church. I, I pray for the day that denominational walls come down and there are no denominational churches and we're all part of the body of Christ. Well, praise God. In 1 Corinthians 4, 1, Paul wrote that ministers of Jesus Christ are stewards of the mysteries of God. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. That is why we as ministers, teachers, uh, we need to spend much time before the Lord, even before we teach, before we preach, before we go out to lead our, 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 our these services, even workshops, teaching experiences. We are ministers of stewards of the mysteries of God. And so we must conduct ourselves in a certain way. Certain things ought not to come out of our mouth. We should not be seen in certain places. Uh, um, our lifestyle should change. And then, ladies and gentlemen, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Ladies and gentlemen, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That is why there, there should be a way in which we should dress to come to church. I mean, I'm not talking about long skirts and having a hat on your head and all that, but there should be some standards, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 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 a woman ought not to be able, ought not to come to church with a split up her skirt and showing her coochie. Uh, I've had, uh, in the past, I've had people come to church, women come to church. I, I remember one time asking a woman to please turn that skirt around to the side and sit over on the wall because uh, uh, she was photographing every man in the church. Even me, I was looking. And and you can't help from looking at someone with their legs wide open and a split up to the gazoo. So I had to say, no, no, no. And she got mad and went around town. Pastor Carter kicked me out of my church. He didn't like the way I dressed. No, I didn't like the way she dressed. And yeah, I did kick her out. I did tell her, you know, you can't come like this. I said, you can sit over against the wall. Next time you come, put on something decent. But you ain't coming around here like this. And so when you get bold and start telling people, no, we will not tolerate this in this church, People hate on you. They will hate on you. They will scandalize your name. But the scripture says, what? Know ye not that you are the body of Christ 
that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are all bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment a person gets born again, the Holy Spirit enters into that person's life to live. That is why uh, the Bible says it's called born again. You must die. The moment you confess Jesus Christ the Savior as Lord, you must die. You actually literally die. You, your pride, your will, your mind, everything about you must die. And then you live again by receiving the life of Christ. There's a transfer that takes place when a person is born again. That is why we teach you can't join the church. You must be born again. We also teach you can't be born into a certain family, and because you're in that family, you're a member of the church. Or you, you, uh, they sprinkle you when you're two months old, and, and, and you become a member of the body of Christ. No, that is incorrect teaching. The Bible says you must be born again. You've got to repent of your sins and confess Jesus Christ and be born again. I want to uh, fast forward a little bit and um, talk about um, the, the, the covering of a woman and um, a, a, a problem that has troubled a lot of women and a lot of men in the church. Um, women ought to have a veil. Women ought to have a veil. And, uh, okay, in our culture, you don't, you don't put a veil on these days. Um, I noticed uh, uh, Trump's wife had a veil on when she went to see the Pope, and she didn't put a veil on when, when, when she went to visit uh, uh, the Israelis. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, we ain't talking about playing cultural games, ladies and gentlemen, but we're talking about approaching God and living for God. Um, there are 10 reasons. I'm looking at the Dakes Bible uh, and there Dakes, um, the Fennis Dakes gave some great uh, commentaries in his Bible. 10 reasons why women were to be veiled. we we'll get away from our text just a little bit. It had... It had been a custom for ages for women to be veiled, starting with Genesis 24, 65. Number two, uh, it was a Jewish law that no woman be seen in public unveiled. It was Jewish law, ladies and gentlemen. No woman was to be seen in public unveiled. Three, among Greeks, Romans, and other nations, it was a custom. It was also a custom. Number four, only public prostitutes in the East went without veils. Ladies and gentlemen, in the East, we're talking about in, 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 in Jerusalem and Israel, uh, uh, only public prostitutes went without veils. Hence, to pray or prophesy without a veil would be identifying Christianity with harlotry. I believe a lot of our women need to know this. And, and uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of the women who say, well, uh, Paul hated women. He didn't want people to prophesy and all. I mean, let's correct the errors. Culturally, a woman who uh, went out in public without a veil was identified with being a harlot. And for a woman to stand up in church without a veil and prophesy would be to dishonor Jesus Christ. And so if a woman appeared in public without a veil, she would disgrace her head. The husband, she would disgrace her husband if she went without a veil. It would be the same as women who had their hair shaved off as punishment for whoredom and adultery. The man was not to wear a veil because he was the image and glory of God. The woman needed, needed one because she was the glory of the man being created for him. The woman needed to wear a veil on her head as a sign of her husband's power over her, thus setting an example of humility and submission to her head, the husband. You can get a, a good argument here from a whole lot of sisters 
uh, 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 he ain't no power over me. So the man does have authority over you, lady. The man's the head of the household. Christ is the head of the man, and 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 you're the head over the children. There's a line, and when that order is disrupted, there is there's confusion and there's devastation. So we need to just read this. I wish I could go over all these, but we don't have time to do this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. The love chapter. Read that love chapter. Though, I've asked, though I speak with tongues and lay hands on the sick and prophesy and have not love, I'm just a noisemaker. I'm a sounding, I'm sounding brass. I'm a tinkling cymbal. So the love chapter is so important. And in chapters 12, 13, and 14, Paul teaches on the spiritual gifts the spiritual gifts. Oh, we don't have time to do all this. Um, but chapter 15, Paul talks about the resurrection. He calls himself an apostle because he saw the resurrected Christ. There are a lot of ministers today. We call ourselves apostles. And, you know, we love these titles. We love these titles. But Paul prefaces that if you are an apostle, that means you saw Jesus. And Paul identifies the time when he saw Jesus. Read Acts chapter 9. He saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And then uh, chapter 15 talks about death. Death and the resurrection. We are sown in corruption and raised in incorruption. When they plant this body in the ground, this body, my body, will be a seed of corruption. But when I rise again uh, in the rapture, um, then it will be a, an incorrupt body. We are sown in dishonor and raised in glory. We are sown in weakness and raised in power. We are sown in our natural body and raised in a spiritual body. We are sown in an earthly body and raised in a heavenly body. We are sown in a flesh and blood body and raised in a changed body. We are sown in a mortal body and raised in an immortal body. I don't have time to talk about that glorified body that each of us will receive. Now, if the rapture comes before we die, then we're going to be translated, changed, changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll be changed from this mortal body as we're go traversing through the air in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Uh, you need a computer to record how quick the time will be. We'll be changed from this mortal body into the glorious body that we will live in in all eternity. Amen. Praise God. So I urge you, I encourage you, read um, 1 Corinthians. Reread it. Reread it. Study it. Study it. Ask questions. Jot down your questions and, and study again. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. He says, watch you. Quit you like men. In other words, live like men. All to live for God. And, and, and uh, uh, walk in love. Walk in love. And we didn't, we, have, we didn't have time to talk about the disorders at the Lord's Supper but Paul gives correction about how to take communion, uh, when to take communion. And some churches say you have to take communion every first Sunday. No, you don't. Or you have to take communion once a year. No, you don't. The Bible tells us, does not tell us when we have to take communion, but it shows us what the Lord's Supper is all about. Well, bless God. We're going to end our recording. And uh, we want you to stay online those of you who can for a few minutes for chat and chew. But we thank God for all over the world people are listening to this, this ministry. And we pray that uh, if you're looking to be saved tonight, ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and receive him by faith to be your Savior, your Lord, your God, and your King. And then we ask you to join us again next week. If you cannot come on live, then get the tape. Uh, at www.backtobasicsministry.wordpress.com. We bless God and we thank God for 